Hi everyone, uh, welcome to week 12. What I want to get started with is flagging the final assessment, which is the final essay. That is a 1500 word essay. It's worth 55% of your overall mark. This essay, you will need to use a minimum of 10 academic sources. Now, given that you will have completed your annotated bibliography assessment by now, that means you've already got five of them, so you need to only find five more. So, minimum 10, yes, but you've already done some of that groundwork. And it's important that you engage with texts from the unit as well as use your own research. So that means you use uh, some of the assigned readings, but you also need to find your own materials as well. The third assessment is going to be assessed along the following criteria. It's going to be assessed according to its ability to address the essay question, the clarity and sophistication of your argument, evidence of having read and understood relevant literature, and evidence of critical thinking and engagement with theory, as well as the ability to write clearly and reference appropriately to university standards. In our case, we are wanting to use the Harvard system. The essay should be 1.5 or double lined spacing. Um, you need to be, it needs to clearly indicate uh, what question you've selected and you must include the reference list at the end of the essay. It needs to be in alphabetical order. You don't need to use numbering or dot points. Okay, that's part of the Harvard uh, method of referencing is just an alphabetical list according to or formatted in a particular way. If you don't include a reference list, this is um, going to put your assessment in danger of failing and academic misconduct. Another thing to think about is avoid overly long sentences. Simple is better. And you'll notice that I've included a link to a handy online tool that can help you with uh, writing more clearly. Let's talk about the overall assessment structure. Now you're going to be using an essay format. So as you know, you're going to have the introduction paragraph, a body and a concluding paragraph. The introduction paragraph, it needs to introduce the topic, introduce your thesis, which is your key argument or your conclusion, and it needs to give an essay outline. It needs to briefly explain to the reader what the structure of the overall essay will be. The body of the essay is comprised of uh, paragraphs um, giving supporting evidence and arguments for the conclusion or the thesis. It needs to be a logical sequence. So think about what order you're going to put your paragraphs in. The paragraph before the conclusion should be what some people call a crunch paragraph. The key lines of argument all come together to demonstrate the credibility of your conclusion or your thesis. And then the concluding paragraph, you don't want to introduce new material. You provide an overview summary of the argument and it's also worth leaving the reader with some food for thought, such as what are some next steps um, in this topic? Perhaps future research or new policy or practice. That's a good thing to have a think about. Now in terms of paragraph structure, you have your topic sentence, which is the first sentence. You have a supporting sentence after that, or a few supporting sentences, and you finish up with a concluding sentence. What's in your topic sentence? It's kind of like similar to the essay structure. Overall, you need to introduce the main point of the paragraph. Um, and it should follow from the previous paragraph where possible. The supporting sentences provide the supporting evidence or data, references, arguments, and so on that support the main point of the paragraph. 
and then your concluding sentence is going to wrap up the paragraph, summarize how the point you're making in the paragraph relates to the overall uh, topic and your overall argument or thesis, and it's going to help lead into the next paragraph. Just a few pointers on how to pass. A common problem with assessment one was that students were not relating their chosen concepts and research back to the specific topic. You need to relate your essay to the specific topic provided in the learning guide. You can't create your own topic and it's essential that you read the instructions for this assignment. Um, you need to demonstrate some basic scholarly research skills. Don't hesitate to ask for advice or help from your uh, unit coordinator or tutor where appropriate. Uh, and remember, and this hasn't been an issue as far as I can tell, uh, Wikipedia is not an academic source. So um, I'll let you, um, I think most of you have your head around that. Make sure to follow the Harvard Referencing Style Guide. That can be found with a really uh, quick Google search. You just type in um, WSU, Western Sydney University, Harvard, and it should be a PDF that comes up as more or less the first um, search result on Google. And don't forget that preparation is key. Spend a bit of time thinking, what's my overall argument? What are the main points I want to make? And then spend a bit of time working out your essay structure so that by the time it comes to writing the substantive content of your essay, it's almost like you're just ticking boxes and dropping in content into the right spot. Now, there are four topics um, that you can choose from for this final essay. The first one is asking, recent crime prevention policy and initiatives can be seen as highly politicized. Discuss the link between law and order politics, fear of crime, and crime prevention strategy using local examples. The second option, citing examples provide a critical analysis of preventive policing strategies, such as hotspot, zero tolerance, problem oriented, and so on, and discuss their impact on the community. In your answer, discuss why these strategies are popular and if there are any side effects on the police and community relations. The third option, crime prevention is, uh, industry is growing at a rapid pace in Australia and around the world. Critically discuss this trend and outline some of the key dangers that may emerge from the commercialization of crime control. The fourth option, discuss the importance of evaluation to crime prevention strategy. Why is it so important in producing effective crime policy and prevention strategies? Before we move on to this week's topic, let's just have a quick recap of last week. The restorative justice approach to crime prevention involves a wholesale rethink of the nature of crime and criminal justice. Restoration is grounded in the principles of Republican theories of liberty and dominion. Crime is a violation of personal dominion of the victim, and it's also a harm done to the whole community. Responding to crime and preventing recidivism requires reintegrating the offender back into the community. Reintegration involves reintegrative, non-stigmatizing shaming and recognition of harm done to victims. Reintegrative shaming can help offenders take responsibility for their actions and learn to share the same norms and values of the community when it comes to offending. Now, some researchers suggest that empathy, that is treating the offender with empathy, and the offender feeling empathy for their victim, is a significant factor in the development of offender remorse and desire to change, and therefore crime prevention. This week we are looking at evaluating crime prevention interventions. Um, overall, we're going to go through um, thinking about research and knowledge. Um, we're going to then discuss some of the frameworks and methods of evaluating crime prevention. And then we're also going to briefly think about the policy process, um, because this is an important thing to keep in mind when do, not just doing evaluations, but thinking about 
how to implement evidence-based policy into practice. Now, before we get into evaluation, um, we want to talk about some um, general principles about research. And the simplest way that I can explain it is that research is about making sense of the world using systematic explicit methods alongside standards of evidence. So when you hear this term empirical, you've probably come across it in your uh, studies. And it basically means that it's empirical is something that's based in experience of the world. So it's produced through our interactions with the world around us. Um, so why do we use this idea of empirical? It just means that the information or the ideas or theories that we're working with have come from engagement with the world rather than someone just making it up without coming into contact with the world. Research is supposed to be more reliable than intuition and more reliable than uncritical acceptance of traditions and more reliable than emotional judgments based on feeling alone. So research should be a key part of practice, it should inform practice, but also keep in mind that practice, because it's based in the real world, also informs research. And research more generally is just a good sort of way to approach life in terms of being an engaged citizen and in terms of finding more personal freedom, not being constrained by assumptions and other people telling you the wrong thing. Now let's talk about two uh, scary words from the philosophy of knowledge that are worth wrapping your head around if you're to understand um, research. And that is ontology and epistemology. Now these are just fancy philosophical terms for how we think about the relationship between our knowledge and the world. Ontology is just a word that basically refers to what exists in the world that we can know about. So when we're talking about ontology, we want to think, well, what are we looking at with this pro research problem? Are we looking at atoms, molecules, human behaviors, measurable outcomes, the meanings of certain uh, texts, and so on? And when it comes to epistemology, that's a fancy word, meaning uh, how we develop valid, reliable, and useful knowledge about the world based on how we interact with the world. In other words, epistemology is talking about um, how do we actually know stuff about the world. Ontology is what is there in the world we can know. Epistemology is how do we know that stuff. So, for example, uh, do we directly experience the world or is our understanding of the world mediated by our senses and pre-existing theories? And as a result, which methods should we use to understand different things? We're going to need different methods for different topics. Now, why do we care about all this stuff, you know? Well, part of being rigorous um, is having an awareness of ontology and epistemology. You don't need to write a paper about it. Just be aware, broadly speaking, that this stuff is important. And part of being rigorous is allowing other people to follow your research approach, understand your reasoning, and in principle, repeat your outcomes, or at least repeat your process. So, it's about providing better reasons for people to believe what you say, so don't simply rely on you saying, oh man, just trust me, just believe me, right? Now, let's talk about the idea of science and the ideal of science and expert knowledge. When we talk about expertise, it's not just as simple as knowing which studies proved a certain theory. It involves ongoing participation and contribution in a community of people who deeply understand a field or a topic. It's not just book knowledge or book smarts, but experiential knowledge. This type of knowledge you can only achieve, you can only get it by doing through practice. So that means that it's a type of knowledge that doesn't translate easily into um, words. Now, what I want to suggest is let's move beyond the antiquated and kind of inaccurate idea of you have scientific theories, and then if you prove the theory, it becomes a scientific law. Um, for reasons I won't go into here, that's basically quite old hat. 
and more importantly it doesn't work in all fields. A better approach is just the approach that a theory is an explanatory framework. It's a collection of interrelated ideas about how things relate to each other, including assumptions about the properties of things, how things work, and the causal relationships between things that the theory covers. Um, there are better theories and there are worse theories. All right? um, it's not that the best theory becomes a, a universal law, it just means the better theories are good at explaining um, what they're talking about and have good evidence behind them. Now, not all evaluations directly test a theory, and not all crime prevention interventions are testing a theory. But in practice, we use theories to guide how we interpret or approach a topic. We use theory to help interpret our findings, but our findings also help us to interpret our theories. And for a neat little explanation of this by a sociologist who studies expertise, you might want to read some of the work by Harry Collins, uh, which I've listed in the reference list at the end. One other set of concepts you might want to be aware of uh, are two broad methodologies of qualitative and quantitative approaches. Uh, and these are sort of two, the two main sort of overarching methodologies in the social sciences more generally. Now when I say methodology, right, that's not as simple as method. It's not the same thing. Methodology is the framework through which research is conducted. And this includes assumptions about how knowledge is formed, right, assumptions about epistemology, and which methods are suited to which problems. When we think of quantitative methodology, we think of numbers. Qualitative, we're usually thinking of words. When it comes to quantitative, we're basically talking about statistical methods. And the strength in this approach lies in its ability to extrapolate knowledge about a population based on just a small, well, not a small, but based on a sample of that population. So it's very useful for things like incidence and prevalence. Incidence meaning the rate of change, or how quickly or slowly something grows or shrinks, and prevalence meaning how much of something there is at a particular point in time. When it comes to qualitative research, um, it's a range of different methods, but common methods include interviewing, uh, analyzing documents, and observational or, or ethnographic work. And the strength of qualitative approaches lies in their ability to understand complex social processes and the human meanings attributed to things in the world. Now, when it comes to evaluating crime uh, prevention, evaluation is the basis for an evidence-based approach. So evaluation can inform future policy developments in the field of crime control and crime prevention. Now, there are divergent opinions on the precise role of evaluation or how to do evaluation, and we'll touch upon that uh, in, in some later slides. Now, evaluation is difficult partly because the results of a crime prevention uh, program are not always clear. Sometimes crime prevention is embedded in other programs, such as social prevention, or they're operating at the same time as other social programs, you know, run by a different agency, unrelated to crime prevention, are happening in the same area. So, evaluation requires a clear understanding of what the crime prevention intervention is actually trying to achieve, all right? You're trying to compare like with like. Now, there are two broad areas of interest when it comes to evaluation, and that is impact evaluation and process evaluation, which, um, in short, impact is looking at the particular outcomes of an intervention. Process evaluation is looking at how did we actually do the intervention. Now, as I've said throughout the course, like most things in life, context matters. No single evaluation method is appropriate to all circumstances, just as no single crime prevention technique is appropriate to all circumstances. Now, one of the key problems when we're talking about evaluation is that there's a lack of investment in program evaluation. Evaluations are rarely a systematic part of project planning when it comes to crime prevention. 
In terms of best practice, evaluations should be uh, incorporated as part of early prevention design and an ongoing aspect of a program. Some of the challenges with evaluation is that adequate planning is needed to ensure that relevant data are produced. And accessing data is often difficult because different agencies have different data collection methods, they collect different data, use different methods um, or measures, and are reluctant to share that information. Now when we talk about outcome evaluation, this is sort of like, this is basically impact evaluation, okay? Um, so outcome evaluation is asking, did an intervention actually lead to a reduction in crime or a reduction in the fear of crime? So identifying uh, whether the measured reduction is a direct result of that intervention is actually challenging. Some variables related to context can influence the outcome of an intervention. One example, you might be familiar with the age crime curve. Young people tend to desist from crime as they mature. So is the change in the crime rate a result of young people maturing and desisting anyway, or is it a result of the specific crime prevention intervention? It's also important to recognize that crime levels are also subject to fluctuations. Is the reduction in crime due to the intervention itself or seasonal or random variation? And in partnership-based interventions, outcomes are often impacted by the coordination among groups or agencies in this partnership and the commitment or lack of commitment of partner organizations, which might um, indicate that it wasn't a problem with the prevention method in itself, it was how it was implemented. It was a problem caused by the partner organizations rather than the theory or practice of the intervention itself. Let's talk about experimental approaches. The sort of gold standard of experimental approaches is the randomized controlled trial. Random allocation of people such as the members of target population, to a treatment group and a control group. Now, the treatment group is a group where the intervention is applied, and the control group is a group where it's business as usual, nothing changes. The groups are compared across certain measures of variables before and after the intervention period. Now, the idea is that because of random allocation, Differences between groups can be more confidently uh, assigned to the specific intervention uh, because it's the key difference between the groups. So the groups are randomly assigned, they're similarly composed groups, and the main difference is that one group um, was given a crime prevention um, program and the other group wasn't. And so any differences later on down the track are more likely to be due to that crime prevention program than some other variable. Now the randomized controlled trial is based on the medical model of research. However, it's difficult in practice, especially when we're thinking about crime prevention situations. We're dealing with human behavior. It's outside a controlled laboratory setting and it's unpredictable and difficult to control these things in the real world. There's also the ethical dilemma that might come up with random allocation, such as when groups of people are deliberately placed at a disadvantage by not receiving the assistance of an intervention. And random allocation isn't always easy to apply in programs that are setting specific, such as situational crime prevention or crime prevention through environmental design. How do we randomize geographically specific crime problems? Then we have quasi-experimental approaches. These are similar to experimental evaluations, except treatment and comparison groups are not randomized. The groups are chosen on the basis of having similar or comparable characteristics, but they're not randomly allocated. They're sort of what you might call naturally occurring groups. This is a more practical version of the experimental approach. The main challenge, of course, is that other differences may exist between the groups that we didn't know about at first that are the cause of different outcomes rather than the crime prevention intervention itself. The idea is to match the groups as closely as possible, take outcome measures very carefully, and 
take them well before and well after the intervention takes place. That is one way to work around um, the non-randomization aspect. And again, this is more easily applied to location-specific interventions, and it's a bit less obtrusive than experimental uh, research designs. This then brings us to non-experimental approaches, which don't rely on random allocation or comparison groups. It's basically the simplest form of evaluation. You take measures pre and post the intervention or the program uh, related to certain outcomes or objectives. Now, the problem here, or not problem, but the challenge here is that it's more difficult to assign causality to the crime prevention intervention, right? Where there's no random allocation and we can't compare it to an, another similar group. However, these approaches are much more easy to implement, they're more practical, and they are more pragmatic when it comes to comprehensive community-based interventions that get implemented nationwide or statewide. And it's better than no intervention at all. This brings us to systematic reviews, which are again a form of outcome evaluation. And systematic reviews are effectively secondary analysis of existing evaluation studies. The two main approaches are meta-analysis and narrative reviews. Meta-analysis is popular in crime prevention. Meta-analysis examines a particular type of program, then synthesizes existing evaluation findings from different research, and calculates the relative impact of different techniques. So by comparing the average effects of uh, different subtypes of programs, such as, for example, different types of situational prevention techniques, the most effective techniques can then be identified. Meta-analysis uses particular statistical uh, techniques that allow different studies to be compared. Now, different studies may have different sample sizes and that sort of thing going on. With, with meta-analysis, these are only as good as the primary evaluations that they actually review. So you need quality assurance, inclusion and exclusion criteria. At a minimum, only studies with before and after measures in the treatment and control groups should be included, and you need strict exclusion criteria to remove the weaker studies. Now, coming over to narrative reviews, these have similar objectives to a meta-analysis, although narrative reviews are more descriptive. Sometimes they themselves are part of a meta-analysis, uh, if there's minimal rigorous evaluation studies available. Now, narrative reviews aim to describe the program aims, components, and processes, and the range of outcomes achieved. They can offer a good overview of particular crime prevention approaches and identify exemplary programs. Now we come across to cost-benefit analysis, which are different ways of assessing the costs and benefits of crime prevention programs. The key aim of a cost-benefit analysis is to measure the savings in terms of monetary values or even harms reduced that come from implementing a crime prevention program. Cost-benefit analysis is going to look at whether the effects produced by a program, such as reduced crime rates, cost more or are worth more than the resources that get spent on that program. In other words, does running a crime prevention program cost more than the money it saves or the harm that it reduces? A key criticism of cost-benefit analysis is that despite claims about objectivity, assigning monetary value to costs and benefits can be inherently subjective. Any decision about costs of anti-crime measures is inherently dependent on a range of decisions that are contestable. And these are decisions about how to value those costs. And this is particularly a program, uh, a problem, sorry, when it comes to intangible costs, such as a victim's pain and suffering. How do you put a dollar figure on that? Um, additionally, early intervention uh, programs compared to criminal sanctions might not be seen as cost-effective because they aim for wide-ranging effects. These effects cannot be narrowed down to just reducing criminality. 
so the benefits are not always financial impacts either. Any attempt to measure costs and benefits needs to be guided by an explicit framework, and these frameworks should not only be based on economic objectives, but also should include criteria around the social de desirability of crime prevention and normative perspectives on crime prevention. Now this then takes us to process evaluation, which as mentioned earlier, is about not so much the impact of a prevention program, but the process. How were the outcomes achieved? How or why did they not work? Or how or why did they work? Process evaluation is about examining a, an implementation strategy, looking at underlying mechanisms that drove the implementation of a program and assessing whether this hindered or helped with the program being delivered. Process evaluation helps to establish the difference between a flawed theory or program and a flawed implementation of that theory or program, i.e. we did the program wrong, we did the theory wrong. Implementation of crime prevention can confound the outcomes of crime prevention. And we've sort of touched upon this earlier when it comes to different stakeholders uh, losing interest in the program or something like that. Implementation failure is a consistent problem with crime prevention policy and practice. Implementation evaluation should go beyond the narrow focus on managerial issues and consider the political context of implementation. Now, some popular approaches to process evaluation include qualitative approaches, and such as interviewing methods with key informants. And these key informants may be key policy officers, program staff, or practitioners, and so on. Why do we look at key informants? These are the people who are most familiar with the program and the context of the program, and are usually at an advantage to give an informed analysis of program success or failure. However, this approach can be criticised as being subjective. Now let's think about the political dimensions of evaluation. Measuring the symbolic aspects of crime prevention is critical, because simply proving that crime prevention is more efficient at a technical level is not enough to make it and an attractive or feasible crime control framework. Responses to crime have an affective emotional component. You'll remember that from week four or, or three. Um, and this component communicates certain messages about social cohesion. And it's important to understand that these dimensions um, are, you know, it's important to understand these dimensions because they influence broader support for certain crime control responses over others. Now this means how a community and how the sort of political elite feel about a particular implementation, a particular crime prevention strategy, is going to determine the political sustainability of these strategies, how long they survive. So apart from evaluating whether programs have shifted public attitudes to social control or crime prevention strategies, the political aspects of crime prevention also extend to whether the preferences of target groups have also changed. That is, programs benefit from being inclusive of the perceptions of a target group in the program design and outcomes. Now let's talk policy at this point. And what's policy got to do with it? The policy process is really straightforward and rational. Okay. So despite appearances, it really goes from a policy with evidence gets attention of politicians who then pass new laws and implement programs. Okay? We need to understand this to connect our evaluation of crime prevention to how it might become um, a bigger program or incorporated as part of an ongoing program or why these things don't get off the ground. The field of policy studies has developed several ways of approaching policy and understanding how it functions in the real world. There are a range of approaches, such as multiple streams, punctuated equilibrium, advocacy coalition networks, and so on and so on. We're just going to look at multiple streams very briefly today. 
Multiple streams is but one useful method for thinking about policy. The multiple streams approach, or MSA, um, was originated by Kingdon um, in their book Agendas, Alternatives and Public Policies. Now, there are three components or three streams in this framework, and these components or streams operate independently of each other. They have a life of their own. At certain point, the different components or streams intersect with each other at opportune moments um, that become windows of opportunity for policy change. The first is the problem stream. Public policies occur when political entities want solutions to issues that they perceive as problems, right? Now, there are several subcomponents of the problem stream. You have indicators, which is how policy actors identify or monitor potential problems. So these could be unemployment rates, rising prices, or other sorts of measures. You have focusing events, which are jarring and sudden um, events that become attached to particular problems, providing motivation or momentum for action or change. So these could be, as I said, notable public events, disasters, scandals, things that get a lot of attention. You also have to think about load in the problem stream, and this is the capacity of institutions to deal with problems. Simply put, if policymakers are dealing with very large or very many problems, this crowds out smaller, newer problems. And then you have feedback, which is similar in principle to indicators, and that is the information related to the problem of interest. So, again, maybe... Um, you know, different uh, rates or changing prices or other measures that are getting fed back to policy actors to see how the problem is going and whether it's worth their time. The second stream is the policy stream. Kingdom, uh, Kingdon referred to this as a policy, policy soup, that there's a finite but complex collection of ideas and possibilities. In other words, a lot of different policy ideas float around and those that survive longer meet certain criteria and prosper. So the survival of policy ideas depends on five subcomponents. You have value acceptability, which basically means that the policy ideas can conform to existing values and constraints. You have technical feasibility, and that means that the technical ability of a government or an organization to create or implement a proposed crime prevention strategy, for example, uh, already exists or is possible within the given constraints. You have resource adequacy, which simply means that the required resources for a particular policy are obtainable. And then we have this idea of policy communities or policy networks. And these are associated with the ideas that shape the dissemination um, of policy ideas. Um, so certain groups, there might be uh, lobby groups, advocacy groups, um, think tanks, uh, shape certain policy ideas. And then there's the idea of network integration. And this refers to how well an, a policy proliferates within these policy communities or policy networks. How well integrated is a proposed idea with the existing um, discourses and frameworks that a policy community operates within. The third of the three streams is the political stream, and this refers to the institutional and cultural context within which policy takes place. Um, there are a few subcomponents to the political stream, including national mood, which is the general orientation of the public towards certain issues or values that are relevant to a policy problem, and party ideology, which is the aggregate orientation of political parties in relevant institutions. Now, party ideology steers the behaviour of parties or groups of people by inhibiting or encouraging certain options rather than others. There's also the balance of interests, and this refers to the aggregate position of relevant interests. These relevant interests may be stakeholders, advocacy groups, and other relevant political and social actors who are related to the policy problem. 
Okay, so you have national mood, which is how the public kind of feels about a policy issue and the related topics. You have party ideology, which is the worldview of the governing party and how that shapes some options as more preferable than others. And then you have the balance of interests, which is the sort of average position of all of the different stakeholders in the policy problem. While the three streams operate independently, the problem, policy, and politics streams, there are certain occasions where these streams overlap or become coupled, and these fleeting moments are called policy windows. Windows open up either in the problem stream or the politics stream, and these provide the institutional contexts, the constraints, and the opportunities through which certain policies are created or become enacted. The key, um, key subcomponents um, of the policy window is um, coupling logic, which is the logic or arguments used to join streams together, and decision style, which is the amount of information that a key decision maker needs before they make a decision about policy. So think of a policy window as literally a window of opportunity where the streams intersect and momentum uh, you know, emerges to push through a certain policy. You can see how this might be relevant to crime prevention policies insofar as certain policies um, that may have a, a good evidence base behind them may not have widespread popular support and so for these policies to become implemented you need these windows of opportunity where um, problems and politics uh, you know allow for a certain crime prevention program to take um, center stage. The last aspect of the multiple streams theory uh, are um, policy entrepreneurs. And these are political and social actors who provide the necessary agency, now that is the power to act, to couple streams together and shape policy outputs. The success of these policy entrepreneurs depends on three criteria. Whether they have the resources, like the time and money, to push a particular agenda. Whether they have access to critical decision makers, so are they in contact with the right people. And we are also interested in the strategies that these uh, policy entrepreneurs uh, use. Uh, the strategies refers to their efforts to manipulate and couple streams. So some of these things will include communication framing, how they shape or frame a problem in a particular way, and even their skills at bargaining, um, political bargaining. Up on the screen, I've got a diagram taken from Jones et al., um, which is basically showing you how the multiple streams um, all sort of come together. And you can see you've got the problem stream, politics stream, and the policy stream. And you've got the policy window and policy entrepreneur, and how those uh, aspects of the model relate to the streams and lead to policy outputs. I'll leave this up on the screen um, for a while for you to um, sort of take down any notes. Okay, so let's go through a key summary of what we've discussed in the lecture. Evaluation research is challenging and complex. 
it needs to be explicit about its theoretical and its research assumptions. There are various different methods of evaluation depending on what type of intervention, the resources available, and the type of problem that is being addressed. Both outcomes and the implementation process are factors that need to be evaluated. Evaluation should be an integral part of crime prevention strategies in general. Measures should be taken before and after the intervention. Developing an evidence base is one thing. Implementing well-supported crime prevention programs as policy is another problem in itself. Policy is not a straightforward or rational process. There are various theories that help us understand the policy process, and today we've briefly looked at multiple streams, which can help us understand how different streams of problem, policy, and politics may intersect at opportune points in time, that is, policy windows, and lead to certain policy outcomes with the help of policy entrepreneurs. A few questions to think about as you're reading your material and studying this topic. Why would we bother with evaluation? How does evaluation help in our crime prevention efforts? What are some key challenges in evaluating crime prevention? And what are some outcomes or factors we would want to look at when evaluating crime prevention interventions? And I've just got listed here some of the key references from this week um, for your information. Uh, there's obviously the assigned chapter, uh, as well as an article from the Policy Studies Journal, uh, the Harry Collins book that I mentioned, and of course Alan Bryman on social research methods.